Okay, great. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. Welcome. My name is Ben Foyer. I'm the chairman of a law firm called the California Appellate Law Group, a 15-lawyer appellate boutique uh, here in San Francisco uh, and soon to be in Los Angeles. Uh, and on behalf of the appellate section of the Bar Association of San Francisco and the Ninth Judicial Circuit's uh, Historical Society, I am delighted to welcome you tonight to uh, nearly, nearly 75 years on how Korematsu has shaped constitutional law. And we are especially excited tonight to have Karen Korematsu herself in the audience, um, which is a, an honor. Before we begin, we have a room full of lawyers, so I'm not going to uh, uh, be, be really crazy and ask you to shut off your cell phones, but we are webcasting this both through the Bar Association of San Francisco and the uh, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals website. So if you wouldn't mind moving your phones to silent or vibrate, that would be terrific. As I mentioned, tonight's program is being put on in conjunction with the Ninth Judicial Circuit Historical Society. Many thanks to Robin Lipsky, the Executive Director, for helping to organize this program. For those who don't know, the Ninth Judicial Circuit Historical Society's mission is to preserve and educate the public about the vibrant legal history of the West and about the importance of an independent judiciary. The group takes oral histories of judges and other important legal figures in the Ninth Circuit, partners on programs such as tonight's, and creates exhibits for display at courthouses and online. You can learn more, including about their work related to the anniversary of Japanese internment and incarceration on their website, www.njchs.org. Uh, and that is, of course, in fact, the topic of tonight's program, specifically how the Supreme Court's decisions uh, in the Korematsu case and the related case of uh, Hirabayashi against the United States involving curfews uh, affected constitutional law in approximately 75 years since they were issued. It's actually 73 years. Uh, because in 1942, President Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9066, beginning the internment imprisonment regime, and it took a couple of years for the Supreme Court to rule in December 1944. Uh, VJ Day came, of course, uh, in September 1945. Uh, the Supreme Court decisions at issue tonight, you're going to hear Don Tamaki talk about in a little bit. Um, but one thing I will point out is, of course, these decisions have never been formally reversed. Uh, and the topic of this program will really focus on uh, the effects of these decisions and the way the doctrines they, that conceived, uh, were conceived in these cases uh, remain an important piece of constitutional law today. Of course, the Korematsu decision is viewed widely as one of the worst Supreme Court rulings ever, along with the Dred Scott decision uh, involving fug fugitive slaves and Plessy uh, against Ferguson upholding uh, segregation in the South. But some, including former Chief Justice William Rehnquist, have observed that at least from an academic perspective, the courts do seem to and perhaps should bend individual rights when the nation is faced with existential threats. In a 1998 book, he concluded that there is no reason to think future courts would necessarily act differently when faced with the kinds of threats the court thought the nation faced in 1944. That said, again, as we'll hear more later, in 2011, former Solicitor General Neil Katyal publicly condemned uh, President Roosevelt's Solicitor General for lying to the Supreme Court in Korematsu about those same threats posed by Japanese Americans. So these are all the issues we're going to talk about today. I'm just going to briefly introduce our panelists so you know who we're hearing from. Um, the first person to speak tonight is going to be Don Tamaki, who is all the way on the far left of, the, uh, of, of me. Um, he's a Bolt Law grad, and he's the managing partner of a law firm called Minami Lu and Tamaki, which is, I believe, the largest or one of the largest minority-owned law firms in California. Um, importantly, he served on the legal team that reopened the landmark U.S. Supreme Court case of Fred Korematsu, who, who Don will tell you about, um, but the Japanese-American who was interned uh, under a great protest uh, during World War II, uh, and whose conviction was later overturned by the person sitting directly to my left, Marilyn Hall Patel. Uh, she was a former United States uh, District Judge for the Northern District of California. She was the first female judge on that court. She was the first female chief judge of that court. Um, she is now retired, but during her tenure, uh, she presided over an error quorum nobis proceeding uh, involving Fred Korematsu's conviction, in which she found uh, his conviction uh, needed to be vacated. Um, to her left is Erwin Chemerinsky. Uh, Erwin Chemerinsky is one of the most well-known and prolific scholars of constitutional law and federal procedure in the United States. He's currently dean of uh, the law school at Berkeley, which used to be called Bolt, but is called just Berkeley now. Uh, and uh, he is uh, the author of some 10 books, 200 plus law review articles, 
and has been uh, calculated to be the second most frequently cited American legal scholar. Um, I mean, second, but you know, <laughs> we'll take it. Couldn't you work a little harder and, you know. And to Irwin's left is Jane Schachter. Jane is a, a, a William Nelson Cromwell Professor of Law at Stanford University. Uh, she is a leading figure in constitutional law and particularly uh, rights of minority groups, especially uh, those of um, uh, minority sexual orientations. Um, and so we are really delighted to have this panel. I don't want to take too much time because uh, we have a lot to cover tonight and we've only got an hour in which to do it. So I'm going to turn the uh, dais over to Don Tamaki who's going to give us a bit of a background uh, to frame up our discussion later. One thing I will say is we do intend to leave time for questions at the end. So if you think of questions during the program, please write them down, uh, otherwise you might forget. So Don, take it away. Thank you, Ben. It's a pleasure to be here with such a distinguished panel. I also want to acknowledge the presence of Karen Karmansu, who's really become a part of our family and has done so much to further her father's legacy. And also present is Dale Manami, uh, served as lead counsel for the Quorum Novus legal team, along with Ed Chen, who's now a federal district court judge, and Bob Rusky is also here. Uh, it's an honor for me to make remarks in behalf of, their, of the legal team. The focus of the panel is from an academic point of view of the constitutional law doctrines arising out of Korematsu. But needless to say, it is difficult for us to view Korematsu in the abstract because of our families who were directly so deeply impacted by the mass incar incarceration of almost 120,000 Japanese Americans, 70,000 who were uh, U.S. citizens. I don't have to remind anyone that the Korematsu case, as Ben has said, has been widely criti criticized as a civil liberties disaster, often characterized as a mistake prompted by wartime hysteria and racism. What is not well known is that the Korematsu doctrine emanates from government claims that were not merely misleading, but were demonstrably false and categorically denied by every intelligence agency responsible for determining whether Japanese Americans posed any threat. Most importantly, the government knew this at the time that it presented these falsehoods and fabrications to the court. Therefore, in our view, a discussion of the Korematsu Doctrine cannot plausibly be separated from the fraud from whence it originated. How did this happen? Well, on February 19, 1942, Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066 putting the eight most western states under the authority of, of Lieutenant General John L. DeWitt and empowering him to designate uh, zones from which any person could be excluded. This set in motion a series of events occurring within days of each other. DeWitt designated all of California and the western halves of Oregon and Washington and the southern ha half of Arizona as military area one. Thereafter, Roosevelt signed Public five, Law 503, which stated, whoever shall enter, remain in, leave, or commit any act in any military zone shall be guilty of a crime. DeWitt Witt followed this cur with curfew orders, as Ben mentioned, requiring all Japanese Americans to remain in their homes from 8 p.m. Uh, until 6 in the morning. Three days later, DeWitt issued another order making it a crime for Japanese Americans to leave military area one. And about a month later, DeWitt issued another order, making it, it a crime for Japanese Americans to remain. So Japanese Americans were faced with diametrically contradictory orders, which simultaneously made them crim criminals if they left their home or if they didn't leave. Obedience to one part of Public Law 503 would necessarily violate the other. The only way they could avoid criminal prosecution was to submit to indeterminate confinement in detention camps. Fred Korematsu, Gordon Hirabayashi, and Minoru Yasui, American citizens, defied these orders and were arrested. The government defended against their challenges on two grounds. First, they claimed the army, uh, the army claimed that Japanese Americans were committing espionage in the form of shore-to-ship signaling. And second, it argued that they were so culturally, linguistically, and racially different that you couldn't trust them to be loyal. In 1944, 
the court heard Korematsu's case and the majority ruled against him, calling the incarceration a military necessity. Despite affirming that racial distinctions are immediately suspect and must be subject to the most rigid scrutiny, the court denied without probing examination that the military orders were driven by racial hostility. The court reiterated the conclusion in Hirabayashi that it could, would not substitute its judgment for that of the military. The court reasoned, quote, the military authorities considered that the need for action was great and time was short, and we cannot, by availing ourselves of the calm perspective of hindsight, now say that, in that at the time these actions were unjustified. However, the lack of evidence troubled Justice Jackson enough that he wrote, quote, how does the court know that these orders have a reasonable basis in necessity? No evidence whatever has been taken by this or any other court. There is a sharp controversy as to the credibility of the DeWitt report. So the court, having no real evidence before it, has no choice but to accept General DeWitt's own unsworn, self-serving statement, untested by cross-examination, that what he did was reasonable, unquote. Forty years later, in 1983, Justice Jackson's worries were validated. In proceedings before Judge Marilyn Hall Patel, we reopened the Korematsu case based on newly discovered secret Justice Dep Department, FBI, FCC, and Naval Intelligence memoranda, admitting that there was no evidence of wrongdoing by Japanese Americans and questioning the Army's reasoning for the forced removal and lockup. Among them were memoranda by Edward Ennis, the Justice Department official supervising the drafting of the government's brief. As Ennis began searching for evidence to support the Army's claims, he found precisely the opposite. For example, the Office of Naval Intelligence, which had lead responsibility for the West Coast, recommended against the mass detention, stating that Quote, in short, the entire Japanese problem has been magnified out of its true proportion, largely due to the physical characteristics of the people. It is no more serious than the German or Italian portions of the population and should be handled on the basis of the indiv individual and not on a racial basis. When Annis discovered that the Navy had not only concluded that Japanese Americans posed no threat, but recommended against the mass roundup, Ennis wrote to the Solicitor General, Charles Fahey, quote, I think we should consider very carefully whether we have a duty to advise the court of the existence of the Naval Intelligence Report. It occurs to me that any other course of conduct might approximate the suppression of evidence, unquote. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover similarly wrote, quote, every complaint has been thoroughly investigated, but in no case has any information been obtained which would, could substantiate the allegation that there have been illicit signaling from shore to ship since the beginning of the war." Unquote. Caught in an ethical dilemma of not wanting to lie to the court, Ennis joined Justice Department lawyer John Burling in inserting a footnote in the government's brief stating that DeWitt's claims were, quote, in conflict with information in possession of the Department of Justice. Unquote. Burling explained the importance of this footnote in a memo to Assistant Attorney General Herbert Wexler. He wrote, quote, you will recall that General DeWitt's report makes flat statements concerning radio transmitters and ship-to-shore signaling, which are categorically denied by the FBI and the FCC. There is no doubt that these statements are intentional falsehoods. He further appealed to Wexler for support. I assume that the War Department will object to the footnote and I think we should resist it, resist any further tampering with all of our force. Well, the War Department did object. Under Secretary of War John J. McCloy uh, called Solicitor General Fahey, who halted the printing of the brief. When Ennis learned of this, he sent a memo to Wexler, quote, strongly recommending that the footnote be kept in, in its existing form. He wrote, this department has an ethical obligation to the court to refrain from citing to what's claims if the department knows that important statements are untrue. The general tenor of DeWitt's report is not only that there was reason to be apprehensive, but also that overt acts of treason were being committed. Since this is not so, it is highly unfair to this racial minority, 
that these lies go uncorrected. This is the only opportunity that the department has to correct them. Despite such protests, the footnote was deleted, and in its place a new footnote was inserted which did not challenge DeWitt's claim, even though every intelligence agency had previously debunked them. In 2011, in an extraordinary confession of error, Acting General, Solicitor General Neil Cotyell acknowledged the government's role in this miscarriage of justice found by the Quorum Nobis Courts, admitting that before Quorum, Quorumatsu first reached the court, the government had known that its own intelligence undermined the rationale behind the mass removal and, and incarceration program, and that the Solicitor General did not inform the court, despite the warnings from the Department of Justice, that failing to alert the court, quote, might approximate the suppression of evidence. What does this all mean for us today? To the extent that the Korematsu Doctrine stands for the proposition that when the government invokes national security, the court should blindly defer to the executive branch, abdicating its constitutional role of being a check and balance against overreach and abuse. The temptation of government officials to present falsehoods and misleading information to achieve political ends may be irresistible, resulting in great damage to the Constitution and to the rule of law. Let it be remembered that when the court failed to subject the forced removal and the incarceration of Japanese Americans to searching judicial scrutiny, and instead in the name of national security, took the government's word for it, that its actions were necessary and reasonable. That failure led Justice Jackson to warn that the president was, quote, a loaded weapon ready for the hand of any authority who could bring forward a plausible claim of an urgent need. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Very interesting. Um, so now we're going to have a uh, roundtable discussion. It's, it's sort of a, a straight line table, I suppose. Um, one of our guests that uh, we had planned to have tonight, Lawrence Friedman, is sick and so wasn't able to um, attend. But uh, Judge Patel is going to moderate a discussion with Irwin and Jane uh, about some of the issues that are raised by uh, this very troubling precedent. So why don't you take it away, Judge? Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Mr. Tamaki, for that very thorough exposition of uh, the history and background. I'd just add a, a footnote, as I recall from reading my history, that McCoy, McCloy, uh, actually um, uh, said that in terms of military necessity, could not let a scrap of paper, meaning the Constitution, get in the way. Um, so th that really th that really speaks to us today, I think, as well, and our concerns that may that uh, may be occurring. But I would like to turn first to Dean. I'm going to call uh, Dean Chemerinsky Dean, and in order not to confuse the professors and <laughs> and Professor Schachter, uh, Professor. But uh, it, it, Dean, um, are there policies and procedures that the Attorney General or the Solicitor General uh, Solicitor General have in place now that would um, preclude these kinds of misrepresentations or omissions being made that uh, that we saw so flagrantly uh, in the uh, in after World War II or during World War II. Yes and no, I think is the answer to the question. The yes part is it's not just the Solicitor General or the Attorney General of the procedures; the codes of ethics have developed since the early 1940s. At the time that this was going on, there was just the ABA canons. The canons were quite general. The first model code with regard to ethics didn't come later, and then, of course, the model rules didn't come until 1983. They spell out in much more detail what lawyers aren't allowed to do, and so they make clear that lawyers are not allowed to make false statements of fact or law to anybody, a court or anybody else. They make clear that lawyers are not allowed to fabricate evidence. Um, Justice Department has more elaborate rules of ethics now than it did in the 1940s. So the simple answer to your question is, yes, there are more specific ethical standards. These make clear that what the government did was unethical. The no part of my answer is, 
um, it was clear that what they were doing was unethical then too. It was just pointed out. Um, the idea that lawyers shouldn't lie to courts doesn't need a written rule in order for lawyers to know that. The idea that lawyers shouldn't fabricate evidence doesn't have to be in a rule of professional responsibility for lawyers not to know it. So I really think the underlying question for us tonight is in part has the law changed, but in part does the change in the law make it less likely this could happen again in the future? So as to the former, Yes, there are more specific ethical rules, but I'm not sure that would really make a difference if you have government lawyers committed to doing what they did here. And what protections do you see in, in um, or weaknesses or strengths uh, in the Korematsu uh, decision with respect to uh, our constitutional structure, particularly in, in is, are there things that would tell you from the Korematsu Supreme Court decision um, what what protections we may have under the Constitution uh, with respect to racial um, uh, uh, minorities and the treatment by majority of uh, the hostile, uh, during hostile times or ma uh, military necessity? The most important protection we have from this happening again is the universal condemnation of the Supreme Court's decision in Korematsu. Now, I overstate a bit with regard to universal. William Rehnquist wrote the book in 1998, Every Law But One, where he defended Korematsu. Um, Richard Posner, then a judge on the Seventh Circuit, defended Korematsu. But essentially, those are exceptions. Overwhelmingly, judges, scholars, condemn Korematsu as being wrong. And that's the best protection we have against it happening again. In terms of constitutional doctrine, the law of equal protection is much more established now than it was then with regard to strict scrutiny for racial classifications. As was pointed out, the Korematsu opinion by Justice Hugo Black mentioned strict scrutiny. It was the first time the Supreme Court ever said strict scrutiny should be used for racial classifications. But one would be hard pressed to find instances prior to the mid-1950s where the Supreme Court used equal protection to strike down laws let alone use equal protection to strike down racial classifications. Now, of course, it's much more established that any racial classifications by the government have to meet strict scrutiny, and the hope would be that would provide some protection. Also, there is a statute now, the Non-Detention Act, 18 United States Code, Section 4001. In part, it was adopted so as to make sure Korematsu wouldn't happen. And yet, again, the underlying question is, how much will these constitutional doctrines, how much the statute protect us if there's another situation where the government wants to engage in such behavior? And Professor, you want to pick it up from there? Sure. Please. So, um, you know, I think the story of Korematsu is a story of institutional failure. And it's a story of almost failure by almost every institution involved, right? The Justice Department, the military, the executive, and most salient for our purposes, the Supreme Court. And the barriers that the Constitution erects are, in the end, maybe not scraps of paper, whoever said that, but um, uh, parchment barriers, right? And so the protections are only as strong as the people who uh, inhabit the offices and the, the judgment that they use in, in um, carrying out their functions. And I know we're not, we're not going to... Um, get into the travel ban in any detail, but I do want to say that in the you know first year of a controversial administration where many people worry about the status of the rule of law and you know uh, uh, some people have mentioned the idea of Korematsu and internment in connection with uh, uh, some of the policies that are circulating today, I for one have been encouraged by the response of the courts, which seem to recognize their role uh, as a break on uh, runaway political trains. And um, at least from the standpoint of that institution, I feel uh, heartened that they're taking their responsibility seriously, more seriously uh, perhaps than they did in Korematsu, although I, I guess it wasn't a failure of seriousness, but it was, uh, I think, a lack of, uh, a lack of courage to, to stand up and take a, a true hard look at what was going on. Do you think that that makes a difference today when we see that this is not so much a, a rush to, to judgment. Uh, military necessity may be claimed, but it's taking a lot longer for courts to address it and to address it more thoroughly than it was addressed 
you know, in, in World War II. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the lessons from the war on terror cases is that, you know, I don't agree with every aspect of all of them, but the fact is, uh, in contemporary times, in those many of those cases, Hamdi, Hamdan, some of the other ones, the Supreme Court played a role. They didn't roll over. They weren't the proverbial, you know, uh, what is it, a potted plant. Um, and, and they made clear that they were going to be part of the equation. Uh, and, and I think that alone is very different from Korematsu. Can I uh, disagree Absolutely. a little bit? Sure. Um, one thing that hasn't been mentioned is that Korematsu is decided in 1944. It's decided after the tide had turned in the war. It had been very easy for the Supreme Court at that time, without looking at whether the racist act from a couple of years earlier was justified, to say that the government just had no evidence that justified it at that point in time. I think that Korematsu is in part about wartime. I think it's in part about a group of justices who were appointed to side with the administration and to not be striking down what the government was doing, and they very much embody that. After all, it's Hugo Black, who we regard as a civil libertarian, who writes the opinion for the court. William Douglas, who might be regarded as one of the most liberal justices in American history, is part of that majority. And so I think we've got to put that in mm -hmm. as part of the context. Um, I, too, like Jane, am encouraged by how the courts have acted in the last year. Um, but I worry, what if there is the next 9-11? What if there is a series of major terrorist acts in the United States? Will the courts still be willing to stand up to the government under those circumstances? And the reason I said I wanted to disagree a little bit is I don't think that the court's ultimate behavior with regard to Guantanamo has been at all laudable. The Supreme Court on June 12, 2008, in Bemidian, struck down provisions of the Military Commission Act. And so this would be your example of standing up to the government. Um, that's now nine and a half years ago. The Supreme Court has not taken another Guantanamo case since. In each instance where the United States District Court for the District of Columbia ruled in favor of Guantanamo detainee, the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit reversed and did so in a series of decisions that completely undermined any meaning of Bemidian or Rasul versus yeah. Bush. The United States Supreme Court denied cert in each and every one of those cases, rendering Bemidian hollow. All of this occurred long after the threats that inspired the Patriot Act or that responded to 9-11 had taken place. Um, and yet the United States Supreme Court still wouldn't stand up to the government with regard to Guantanamo. Yeah. No, that's, I, I, I don't debate that. Um, I think at the time of uh, Boumediene and some of the earlier cases, I was surprised that the Supreme Court, you know, took as close a look as it did. It, it seemed conceivable that the court would, um, you know, be a very, be a very uh, kind of light touch on it. You're right, though, uh, they've been missing in action for for a long time. Well, to some extent, they, they, they did touch upon it, though, did they not, with respect to at least not acceding always to the executive branch mm -hmm. in, in, those, in those cases, in Hamdi and Hamdan. Right, Medellin, that was the difference, and, yeah. Correct? Yeah. Well, I, I'm going to be even more of a dissenting <laughs> voice. Let's go okay. through them one at a time. Let's take Hamdi versus Rumsfeld. This involves an American citizen, Yasser Hamdi, and he was born in the United States, who was apprehended on the battlefield in Afghanistan. He was kept, when he was first taken to Guantanamo and then it was discovered as an American citizen, he was brought to a military prison in South Carolina. There were two issues before the Supreme Court. First, could the government detain an American citizen as an enemy combatant? Did that violate the statute I mentioned, the Non-Detention Act? And the Supreme Court ruled five to four that the Non-Detention Act was not violated here because the general authorization for the use of military force was enough to detain Hamdi. If a general authorization of military force is enough to permit detention, what's really left of the Non-Detention Act? In fact, it was Justice Scalia in a dissent joined by Justice Stevens 
who said that unless Congress suspends the writ of habeas corpus, you shouldn't be able to have an American citizen ever detained without being indicted and prosecuted. Justice Souter and Ginsburg dissented saying that the authorization for use of military force was not specific enough. So I look at that majority opinion on Hamdi and I go, that's not providing all that much protection. Then the court went on and said, but Hamdi has to be given some form of due process, just so kind of said we're not going to define what it is. But she said it would be okay for the government to put the burden of proof on Hamdi to have to establish that he's not an enemy combatant. That doesn't seem to me so much protection. The companion case to Hamdi that came down the same day was a case called Padilla versus Rumsfeld. It involves a man by the name of Jose Padilla who was apprehended at Chicago airport allegedly for plotting to build and detonate a dirty bomb in the United States. He was taken and held in custody in New York. A habeas corpus petition was filed on his behalf in New York. The Second Circuit ruled that the government was acting impermissibly, holding an American citizen as an enemy combatant. Um, but while it was pending, he was transferred to military prison in South Carolina. The Supreme Court ruled five to four that the case had to be dismissed on venue grounds because a habeas petition has to be filed in the district where you're held, and he wasn't being held anymore in New York. He was being held in South Carolina because that's where the government took him and required him to start all over again. That doesn't seem to me the court standing up very much to the government. And you're right about the Midian striking down the Military Commission Act, but then, as I said, after that, the Supreme Court never took another Guantanamo case, letting the D.C. Circuit undermine Bemidian. So I don't think that the record since 9-11 of the Supreme Court has been all that admirable or all that different than what happened in Korematsu. Well, let me just jump in and say the, 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 di the distinction I would draw, I don't really disagree about any of the individual cases, but the distinction I would draw is that the court in Korematsu basically signaled and was quite explicit about it to the executive and to the political branches, do what you want, tell us that it's wartime, and we back off. Yeah. And at least the government and the executive knew, based on the series of cases during the Bush administration, they were going to have to come in and defend and explain, and they weren't going to get quite that carte blanche. Now, that's a, you know, that's not saying that much, but but Fair if the baseline is Korematsu, it's it, it's better than it than it was. And since we're speaking about Korematsu, what I find interesting is that very few of, of the four cases we were just talking about, uh, the post 9/11 cases, um, really mentioned Korematsu. A couple of them mention uh, one of the dissents, either Jackson or Murphy's dissent. It did seem that uh, Justice Souter in Hamdi, in the concurring opinion, um, danced very close to saying, you know, we should disavow, yeah. disavow Korematsu, but they never quite got to it. Yeah. Why not? What do you think is happening? Well, I think that uh, Irwin touched on it earlier. Korematsu is part of the, what some people call the anti-canon with Dred Scott, with Plessy, um, with some other ignominious cases um, that it sort of, um, it won't be cited for, for on the merits because it's, it's, um, it's stigmatized. And so I think the, the court just kind of stays away from it without necessarily wanting to kind of confront and engage directly with you know, uh, the, how far the exigencies of war can carry, uh, can carry a government policy. I, you know, Justice Jackson made the point in, in Korematsu, interestingly, would it have been better if the court didn't get involved at all? Because once the court is involved and putting its stamp of yeah. approval on it, then that kind of lingers and persists and creates a set of questions um, which we wouldn't have. Obviously, ideally, the court does its job, step, uh, steps in, and performs strict scrutiny in some meaningful sense. I, I think we'll touch on strict scrutiny later, but I do want to say just briefly that the idea of strict scrutiny in Korematsu was a, uh, a hint and a precursor mm -hmm. that we didn't really have the doctrinal elaboration for some time, and I think there's some interesting dimensions of that. We well, can why, talk about. why don't you mention okay. that and, and, and um, how that plays out, has played out yes. through when, when, in fact, when, in fact, did we first see yeah. an actual uh, application of that principle? Right. And then what has happened since then? So, so, so some background. I think uh, we're talking about 1944. Let's, let's wind the clock back to 1938, because what happens in 1938 is we get the law's most famous footnote, right, footnote four. And footnote four of Caroline Products, 
which is a, a sort of you know, uh, uncontroversial case about the regulation of, of milk products, uh, Justice Stone drops a footnote saying, you know, there may be some times where we should look more closely, we should perform a more demanding version of scrutiny, including uh, for policies that harm discrete and insular minorities or uh, you know, reflect racial prejudice, broadly speaking. Um, and yet, it's, it's, it's just a stone three years later in the Hirabayashi case, uh, comes a year before uh, Korematsu upholding the uh, curfew law for unanimous court who writes the opinion with no connection between the footnote he dropped a few years back and the, what's <laughs> going on in Hirabayashi. Um, also a couple of years before Korematsu in the Skinner versus Oklahoma case, uh, the court actually uses the phrase strict scrutiny. It's not a race case. It's a case about um, the compulsory sterilization under Oklahoma law of so-called habitual criminals, a very brutal law um, that was uh, overturned by the court, uh, and they use the phrase strict scrutiny. Um, the, the, the place where you might expect to find it in the 1950s in Brown versus Board doesn't talk about strict scrutiny at all. I mean, the case is as much about education as it is about race. But its companion case, Bowling versus Sharp, which involved the uh, District of Columbia uh, school system, segregated, um, and was challenged under the Fifth Amendment because the Equal Protection Clause does not by its own terms apply to the federal government. And so the way you get the norm of equal protection to apply to the federal government is through a complicated application of the due process clause, and that's what the court was talking about in Korematsu, because similarly, the equal protection clause by its own terms does not apply to federal action. Um, and, and so Bowling versus Sharp talked uh, about the necessity for you know, uh, closer scrutiny, but it's really not until the 1960s, the McLaughlin versus Florida case, which is a precursor to Loving versus Virginia, the case that you probably all know about striking down bans on interracial marriage. So McLaughlin is a Florida law that uh, prevents uh, interracial couples from cohabiting overnight together. And that's uh, struck down, and the court starts to talk about a strict scrutiny in the case of race discrimination. And now the, uh, the idea of strict scrutiny has migrated from race to fundamental rights derived both under the Due Process Clause and the Equal Protection Clause, Roe v. Wade, um, uh, 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 the right to, fundamental right to vote, First Amendment doctrines, it's kind of um, uh, uh, morphed to a, a number of different doctrines. Um, so it's, it takes quite a while before it takes the form that we know it. The government has to show a compelling state interest and the uh, statute has to be narrowly tailored to uh, uh, to, to effectuate that compelling interest. Um, so it's now established and would make a case like Korematsu, I think, analyzed very differently. The structure is there. I will say, as an aside, that strict scrutiny as a source of protection for racial minorities has not played out particularly well. It is, in fact, over the last few decades, whites who have had gotten the most benefit from strict scrutiny. Why? Because strict scrutiny for race-based discrimination is not triggered unless race is used facially in the statute or there's clear proof of discriminatory intent, that is intent to use race by the government. And, and the court is pretty stingy in finding that. So what does that mean? That means policies like affirmative action and race conscious uh, voter districting. Those are the places where you're more likely to see strict scrutiny triggered, right? So it's, it's, it's an irony uh, that at least in recent times, uh, strict scrutiny, uh, while much more elaborated and much more doctrinally kind of uh, developed, has not uh, been well matched to the kinds of racial inequalities that we've seen. As far as a, a, a repeat of Korematsu, you know, perhaps involving you know, different groups today, uh, strict scrutiny would certainly uh, uh, be there uh, and be analytically uh, appropriate for that kind of. If Anything I could, you want to say with respect to strict Sure. Scrutiny? I think Jane has done a terrific job of describing how the law developed. I think the underlying question is of profound importance 
to what extent can legal principles and legal rules really work to protect us? You're absolutely right that if the government were to engage in something like Korematsu, some form of racial profiling that led to detentions, strict scrutiny would have to be the test. And as you rightly point out, the question is, is it narrowly tailored to achieve a compelling government interest? The government would talk about winning the war, preventing terrorist activities that could endanger millions of people. That surely would be a compelling interest. You then get to the question of, is it narrowly tailored? Well, one of the things we haven't said is how if the government action in Korematsu was clearly unconstitutional for any reason, it's because it wasn't narrowly tailored. It was tremendously over-inclusive and under-inclusive. It's over-inclusive because not one Japanese American during World War II was ever indicted or convicted of espionage or crime against national security. And it's tremendously under-inclusive because there's lots of people who may have been a threat to national security who weren't Japanese Americans who weren't covered by this. This isn't something we just know in hindsight. If you read Justice Murphy's dissent, if you read Justice Jackson's dissent, they talk about the kind of screening that was being done in England of those who were of German descent and how England was able to be able, without interning people or evacuating people, to protect national security. So the absence of narrow tailoring was evident in 1944, but it didn't stop six to three of the court doing this. Is the fact that now there's a test that uses the words narrow tailoring going to really make a difference if there's a similar thing? I'd love to believe it would. <laughs> I think it's going to all depend so much on what's the context in which this really comes up. Yeah. The other thing I think to say about these levels of scrutiny is that everything we know about contemporary 14th Amendment jurisdiction is they're extremely malleable. They bleed into each other. You know, sometimes you get a version of so-called intermediate scrutiny for gender-based classifications that seems tougher than strict scrutiny. Sometimes you get one that seems just like rational basis. And there is, I think, you know, it's another version of, you know, parchment barriers. These are doctrinal barriers written on a piece of paper. Who's, who's applying them? How are they being applied? And the kind of, I think uh, Erwin is correct, the, the, the cries of wartime necessity and threats to public safety, you know, are as likely to overwhelm kind of doctrinal niceties as not to. Can we rely on our federal judiciary, the unelected judges, to be willing to stand up to the government in the time of wartime hysteria? Are they likely to do so? I want to believe it, and yet history causes me real pause about that. Speaking of uh, Korematsu in, in, in general, if we, we've now talked so much about strict scrutiny and the things that lawyers like to discuss and yeah. so forth, what about you know other Americans out there who are not lawyers but who care very much about um, the executive branch and its conduct and about the courts upholding you know their rights and so forth? What has Korematsu really meant, meant for them in the last, say, in the last 30, 40 years? Yeah. Well, I guess what I would say is, you know, Korematsu is a powerful historical and cultural symbol. Um, and I, I think it, it, it stands for a grave uh, error. Um, how many, you know, kids are learning about it? Is it, you know, I, I, saw, I saw a um, survey now maybe 10 or 15 years old. Um, about the coverage of Korematsu in high school history books. And it's there as part of the, you know, coverage of the internment policy, but, you know, very little is, is done with it. So I think, as with so much else in terms of public knowledge about how government operates, it would be better if there were more, but it is, it is, it is kind of um, there, I think, as a powerful symbol. And again, I mentioned this earlier, but um, shortly after Election Day or shortly before Election Day last year, uh, somebody associated with the Trump campaign was on TV saying, well, look, if there had to be internment of Muslims, you know, the Supreme Court has said in Korematsu, that's okay. And it was, I think, shocking to a lot of people to hear that, right, to actually hear that argument made for all the reasons that we've been, uh, that we've been talking about. 
So I think, you know, largely it's a sort of anti-icon or a negative icon or something like that. Um, but, you know, uh, things, things can be rehabilitated quickly in the, in the mind of the public in, these, in, the, in the context of war and fear and all of those things. So I think it's a, you know, it's a, it's a mixed proposition. The only thing I'd add to that is that's what I think Justice Robert Jackson meant when he said the Korematsu was there like a loaded gun. Mm -hmm. It's never been overruled. And so my answer to your question, Judge, is so long as we remember Korematsu, so long as we strongly condemn Korematsu, make it less likely there'll be another Korematsu-type situation in the future. That's our best protection. And that really uh, gets to maybe an even more fundamental question, which we have faced, I think, for centuries, and that is security versus liberty. What happens when, in fact, there's an existential threat? Um, what happens to liberty? You probably answered it indirectly, sure. but, um, uh, oh. but it's, it's, a, it's a philosophically troubling question because, and it comes up all the time, you know, every, every few years. The only thing I'd rephrase is it's the perception of the existential threat that becomes the basis for taking away liberty. In World War I, Congress passed a law that, among other things, made it a crime to criticize the draft or the war effort. You'll all remember the first Supreme Court cases to really deal with free speech, cases like Schenck and Debs and Frowork and Abrams, were for speech that was incredibly tame and mild. Schenck was circulating a leaflet arguing that the draft was involuntary servitude in violation of the 13th Amendment. And yet in all of those cases, the Supreme Court upheld the convictions in long prison sentences. After Korematsu, you've got the McCarthy era, where people just from being suspected of being communists could lose their jobs or even their liberty. And the Supreme Court didn't stand up and provide protection. And so it's less about the reality of it in terms of the existential threat, more about the perception of the existential threat. Now, I'd like to believe we're more enlightened now. The doctrines are better established. The condemnation of the past is clear. And that our courts will stand up to the government and protect liberty. Um, and I would hope we'd remember that none of these instances was the repression necessary in order to prevent the existential threat. The speech during World War I wasn't really any threat to the war effort. The Japanese who were interned were no threat to the United States at all. The suspected communists were no threat. Will we learn from this that every time in history there's been this perception of existence that the response has been repression and we weren't made any safer? Uh, I would like to believe that. I'm skeptical, though. Professor, you yeah. com comment and, and also. Um, how good are courts at determining what is an existential threat or yeah. uh, whether it's uh, just a politically motivated one? Well, I'm always skeptical of the extent to which we can expect courts to fully step out of cultural and political moments and, you know, operate completely independently. I think that's just not how life works, right? I mean, I think courts are composed of people who are among us and are going to be tainted by the same kinds of things. And so our, our expectations of judges, I think, periodically run into that reality. It's one of the, you know, it's one of the hard lessons I talk to my students about because they want courts to be heroic and to stand above the current moment. And we all want that. And sometimes they do. Sometimes they do. But it's, it's not common. And if you start to think about it, it's, it's pretty clear why, right? Now, we're in a moment now, right, where basic questions about truth and facts and what has happened and what has not happened um, are really up for grabs in a way I feel like I haven't seen in my lifetime. Um, and again, to circle back, I mean, courts, I think, so far have responded by saying, we're going to deal in facts. We're going to look at facts. We're going we're to look for evidence. We're not going to get caught up in you know, social media wars about what happened and rumors and this and that. And so I think there, you know, 
There are the outlines of some hope for courts to actually play an independent function. But I think Irwin correctly points out what happens when there is another 9-11 or there's another kind of um, dramatic terrorist attack. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to say that the ground won't shift in ways that are worrisome, but there's hope. There are some signs of hope. Are there any other comments you would like to make on, on the subject? Mr. Tamaki, are there any questions you would like to, well, to raise? I, the, or comments, this is something like that the make. Quorum Nobis legal team talks about all the time, and that is basically that these judicial decisions arise not in a vacuum, but within the context of the political pressures and values of a given time. And um, I mean, one comment that I was thinking is that if the Korematsu precedent is so stigmatized, that why doesn't the court take any opportunity to repudiate it? Uh, <clears throat> that, that's kind of one thing. And I, I, I recall back after the, um, we reopened the case and we got national publicity in front of uh, Justice uh, Judge Patel, uh, they did press did interview John J. McCloy. Uh, and he said, well, why, you know, it, this attack on Korematsu is wrong because he said basically we may need that someday. Um, and so that was his thinking that in a, in a very, the blunt instrument, over-inclusive, under-inclusive, was appropriate uh, to deal with this so-called existential threat. You know, we, I, I'm with you, and I think we, we agree with you when we talk about this, that uh, it's really up to uh, creating enough public education to uh, create an atmosphere where judges feel it's the right thing to do to ask probing questions, to ask for some minimal amount of evidence of reasonableness before curtailing civil liberties in such a broad way. Don, didn't your team ask the Obama administration at one point to try to push uh, over? I know some team. I know the Obama administration was asked at one point in the early uh, uh, years of the administration to try to push overturning Korematsu as part of uh, some of the terror cases. Well, one of our the team members, Peter Irons, who actually co discovered the the evidence, and Judge uh, Dean Shimerinsky knows him personally, uh, was asking the court, you know, maybe it's the time for you to to do something to actually repudiate it and put it to bed, to, to, so it's truly anti-canical. -can uh, but it hasn't come up, and, mm. and we hope that there are opportunities to chip away at some parts of the Korematsu case. I mean, this principle that um, the courts will stand down, the courts will look the other way uh, when the government invokes this incantation of national security we, we, we hope that as a general principle, the, the court might say, well, no, that was, we did that in 1943 and 44, and it was a really bad thing, and it was bad policy. Um, and we realize, you know, it, the Korematsu case not, might not arise in the same sort of detention sense, but at least as to the, um, uh, the courts uh, not abdicating their role as a, as a check and balance on the executive branch, that there would be some comment about that. It does seem to me that um, uh, they have been, it's not been with all d deliberate speed. It has been very, very uh, um, plotting in, in many of these cases, including the travel ban cases, and taking a lot of time. and. Unlike you know what happened in Korematsu and Hirabayashi and so forth, those cases were rushed through in the first instance, um, and then on on review. So um, maybe with a little more plotting, uh, that's plotting, not plotting. Um, <laughs> plotting, uh, we uh, we in fact uh, can uh, do a better job, uh, and judges uh, can look at the record more thoroughly and get a fuller record instead of just jumping. Uh, to uh, a quick conclusion on a shoddy record. Um, do you wish to comment on any of this? Any further? Okay. Well, I want we to try to, uh, yeah, I want to yeah. try to open up the floor to yes. questions, but okay. before we do that, let's give a round of applause to the terrific panelists tonight.
Um, you know, raise your hand if you have questions. We're going to repeat the question after you say it for the uh, webcast. Uh, and you know, one thing I, I just want to keep in mind, or at least want to point out, we're, we want to make sure we avoid talking about any cases that are or might appear before the Ninth Circuit, because we are broadcasting on the Ninth Circuit's website and have the involvement of the uh, Historical Society. So uh, we want to kind of keep those lines drawn. So um, I saw one question here and then another one back there. So let's go right here. The, the question again for the webcast is, how was Fred Korematsu's conviction overturned by Judge Patel uh, if the Korematsu decision from the Supreme Court is still good law? Well, the, that was a bit of a shock to me when, I, when the case was filed and I looked at it and I said, wait a minute, that's a Supreme Court decision. What am I doing with this? But in fact, um, because this was the, the court of conviction of Mr. Korematsu. The Northern District of uh, the California. The Northern District of California. And, Hirabayashi was convicted in the District of Washington and, and uh, Yasui in the District of Oregon, and those cases were all filed essentially around the same time. They were filed as petitions for writ of quorum nobis, which meant that the court could look behind the record and determine whether or not um, there, there was any error such that it uh, justified um, uh, setting aside the conviction, but it just meant setting aside the conviction before that court and not, you know, didn't have the authority to overturn the Supreme Court's decision. I will say that we struggled with finding the right vehicle to reopen Fred's case and Gordon's case and Min's case. And uh, in, in 1943 and 1944, the issue was, was this mass roundup constitutional? And in 1983, the, the legal question was different. It really was, did these gentlemen get a fair trial? because of governmental misconduct. That's a different question. But the underlying facts for both scenarios are the same. In other words, the government lied to the court in order to manipulate the outcome of these momentous cases, and in doing so, created a really bad precedent or anti canonical law, but at the same time, railroaded their criminal convictions. And it, we, there wasn't, it was one of the few mechanisms that wasn't time barred. And this is, these are 40-year-old ancient cases when we reopened them. So it was, a, it was a backdoor way of getting to the underlying facts upon which this precedent is based. And, and that's our message. It is based on a foundation of fraud. And that in itself is a historical lesson. We think it stands as more of a warning uh, than it does a precedent. But that's a warning worth heeding. But that's the short end of that explanation. Right. It was the discovery of the government's lies that allowed the, case, the, the conviction to be reopened specifically without addressing the um, Supreme Court. I uh, saw a hand over here. Yeah, I'm Bill Menominee. I'm Don Menominee's partner. He signs this question. <laughs> 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 but uh, we've always had this conversation of your precedence of, of laws based on the facts. You see lies and all from the facts. And the facts turn out to be a foundation of fraud then what happens to the precedent? The pre and, how, and how do you, I haven't seen any legal research on it, and perhaps if you and the professor can help us, it of course weakens the precedent, but did it actually uh, destroy the precedent? So the, the question is really one of, of uh, you know, relating to the concept of stare decisis, the idea that a decision by a higher court is binding precedent on lower courts. And the question is, uh, if it, legal decisions are based on facts, uh, and that leads to precedence. And if the under, it turns out later that the underlying facts were just completely wrong, what does that do to the precedent besides kind of weaken it in a persuasive way? How, or, or how might that affect the precedent uh, doctrinally? Only the Supreme Court can formally overrule a Supreme Court precedent. We can certainly say that the facts that underlie a precedent have been proven to be wrong and that that precedent isn't deserving of respect in the future, or we could, as you did, as Judge Patel found, say that the facts that underlie a particular criminal conviction were false and can overturn that criminal conviction. Now, the larger question really is, in light of the Supreme Court not having overruled Korematsu, how likely is it to be a precedent in the future? And this is what we've been talking about tonight. Um, 
my problem with discussions of stare decisis, and this is what Ben points us to, and there's huge law review articles, whole books on stare decisis, and they always conclude the same way. Precedent should be followed except when it should be overruled. <laughs> <laughs> and of course that's right. And so my answer is, once you've proven the underlying facts behind a Supreme Court decision are wrong, it shouldn't be respected. It shouldn't be followed in a circumstance like this. Korematsu shouldn't ever be used by any court. But I'll end where I started. It hasn't been overruled either. And that is what distinguishes it from, you know, we're talking about the, the, the list of cases that it joins. You know, Dred Scott is overruled by the, the Civil War amendments. Uh, Plessy versus Ferguson is overruled, although, you know, a little more cagely in the opinion than it might have been, but it's widely regarded now as clearly overruled. Um, and that's not true about Korematsu. Now, maybe, you know, they haven't had the next internment policy to say that Korematsu no longer stands. But that wouldn't, I think, uh, prevent them were they so inclined from uh, overruling it. So I agree, and to, you know, it's, it's up to the Supreme Court. This is an egregious uh, version, the, the facts having been uh, revealed to be based on lies and, and misrepresentations. It's an egregious version of what is a, you know, a more pedestrian part of the inquiry about whether precedent should be overruled, which is, you know, the facts have changed, the relevant, you know, facts about how a particular doctrine or law operates have changed, and that can be, uh, you know, a powerful argument for uh, overruling precedent. This is in a different kind of stratosphere. Um, but, you know, again, the opportunity, will it, will it come up? Um, you know, maybe not until there's another uh, policy that squarely engages the precedent. I saw a hand here, and then we'll go there. So go ahead, sir. Maybe. So, so let me let me uh, just repeat the question for the webcast. So the question is, uh, in the opinion, one of the facts identified supporting the majority's decision is that some 5,000 Japanese Americans refused to pledge allegiance and some other 2,000 Japanese Americans asked to be returned to Japan. Um, do those facts hold up and kind of what, what do, you know, what, you know, what do you think about that? Well, really quickly, by the end of 1942, almost 120,000 people were removed from their uh, homes, their jobs. They lost their property. They were confined in 10 American-style concentration camps stretching from California to Arkansas. In 1943, a year later, I think the government officials begin to feel that this population is not at all dangerous. So they, they had this plan of issuing loyalty oaths. They were specifically very poorly worded questions. They call them 28, numbers 28 and 29. 28 asks, uh, do you uh, forswear any loyalty to the emperor of Japan? And then 29 said, and will you bear arms in defense of this country? And so uh, many people, you know, you gotta remember people like my parents had never been to Japan. They were born in this country they had no loyalty to the emperor. So why is, is the government now asking us to forswear loyalty when we never had that in the first place? So some of those people answered no. Uh, other people said, yes, I will uh, pick up arms in defense of this country. But they gave a conditional answer. But you have to let us out. We are American citizens. Let us out, let, let our families out. And if you gave a conditional answer, 
you were put in the no and no category. Those people were then removed to a segregated camp called Tule Lake in Northern California. And unlike the other camps, uh, which were typically surrounded by six uh, guard towers, machine gun towers, uh, Tule Lake had 24 uh, machine gun towers, six tanks, and a battalion of 1,000 soldiers guarding it with a stockade, a prison within a prison within that camp, where all the so-called disloyal were, people were, were put there. And so the conditions there were exponentially more brutal than, than in the other camps. And then toward the end of the war, they were the last to be let out. And many did not want to return to their neighborhoods for fear that they would be uh, attacked and, uh, and, and uh, put under very terrible conditions given the racism of the time. And so the government actually had said, well, we'll let you remain in this camp, uh, but you should forfeit, if you forfeit your American citizenship. And for the 5,000 of them, they re they, their thinking was, well, American citizenship isn't really worth much anyway. I've lost my property. They've taken my home. Uh, I've been separated from my family. Um, they put me in this prison camp. And 5,000 were uh, uh, abandoned their citizenship. And they were deported to Japan, not realizing they, they were returning to a war-torn, devastated country uh, in which people were starving, literally. And so it took another legal action by Wayne Collins, who originally represented Fred Korematsu, to win back these individuals' American citizenship. And they didn't return to the United States for many years. And so this idea that uh, somehow this is evidence of disloyalty is really uh, something that is just completely taken out of context. Incredible. Um, I had seen a hand there. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the, the question is about the um, legality of Executive Order 9066, separate from the constitutionality of it uh, in terms of its, its effect, but whether the president has authority as the executive, as commander in chief, to kind of do this sort of thing, to order internment. I, I, I'll actually comment on that. I wrote an article for the Huffington Post on this topic to a degree, and uh, shortly after, a few months after Roosevelt uh, issued the executive order, Congress kind of came along and uh, enacted a statute um, enshrining this, creating this authority. So it did so after the fact, but it was ultimately approved. Um, but what do you guys have to say about that? Well, uh, you know, uh, the, the policy would be benefited from congressional authorization just under a standard kind of Youngstown analysis that the, the uh, executive authority when combined with uh, congressional authority is, is, is greater. Youngstown, of course, coming a decade later. Yes, yeah. right, right. But, but you're asking today would it, would? Yeah, I guess I'm just wondering. Erwin, you want to you take that? <laughs> the, the question is, does the executive have authority to do this, to kind of declare part of the United States to be under military authority? I think there's two different questions there, and Jane gets at it. One is, as a matter of separation of powers, does the president have the authority to do it? And second, as a matter of individual liberty is equal protection, does the president have the authority to do it because it's going to violate people's rights? In terms of the former question, I agree with Jane. I think it would require an analysis under Youngstown as to whether it violates separation of powers. I would argue that absent congressional authority, the president doesn't have the ability to do that. Um, but I don't think you could say it's resolved. Hirabashi, Korematsu have never been overruled. And then you get to the second question, which is really what we focused on tonight in terms of the denial of liberty. 
the denial of equality that results from such an order. But I don't think there's a definitive answer to your question. I mean, there was an act in, in place at the time, the Posse Comitatus Act, which right. mm -hmm. as a general rule, post-Civil War uh, statute, yeah, prevents the military from acting in a police capacity in the United States uh, domestically on U.S. territory. So, you know. Um, you have any other questions? I see one right here. Yes, Karen. Uh, and I think that's a really great way to wrap up. That, and for anyone listening on the webcast, uh, the, uh, Karen Korematsu was telling us that the Fred Korematsu Institute um, at uh, korematsuinstitute.org uh, creates kits to educate uh, students about the history of uh, this internment incarceration period uh, during World War II, uh, and that you can go there and get some for free. Um, so with that, thank you so much for staying late. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, we'll see you soon. Thanks again.